All right, you ready to do this? Sounds like a plan. All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here with my guest. Very excited to have as my guest, PJ Lewis. PJ, welcome. Thank you so much. All right. So PJ is a registered clinical and Canadian certified counselor, as well as a clinical director of the DBT Center of the Fraser Valley in Canada. PG has particularly, particular expertise in providing individual, group, and family treatment to high-risk youth and families experiencing concerns such as suicidality, self-harm, emotional dysregulation, impulsivity, depression, anxiety, among other things. PJ also has specialized training in DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, integrating trauma treatment into DBT, and has extensive background in DBT program implementation for the youths and adults in government agencies and community services, school boards, and educational institutions. So DBT is huge. (laughs) Um, Before we get into that, PJ, once again, thank you so much for for being here and share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are now. So originally I was the, uh, the, the kind of a novelty for my family. I was born on the West Coast of Canada in Vancouver, British Columbia, and the entire rest of my family is from the East Coast of Canada in Newfoundland. So, yeah, and I still find myself on the West Coast. I'm out here just a little bit further east in Abbotsford in the beautiful Fraser Valley here in British Columbia. Awesome, awesome. All right, so interesting uh, background. Your your bio is very intriguing to me because in a way it's similar to um, some of my experience, but let's get into it here. How did you get into this, into this field and working with kids in this, this population? You know, it's kind of interesting because I didn't set out to be a therapist. (laughs) My background, my undergraduate studies began in kinesiology and I was kind of heading the medicine route, um, and did some volunteer work in a hospital and really enjoyed the, the science and the medical side of things, but didn't really love my experience where I felt that, you know, people were kind of um, numbers and cogs in a wheel and whatnot. And I was really craving uh, um, a much more personalized and meaningful interaction with, with folks um, and really helping them to, to meet where they're at. And, um, you know, spent a few years trying to figure things out, working in the nonprofit world and all the rest of it and then eventually came back to school thinking I was going to be a teacher and you know I had a, a wonderful professor challenge me and and I was taking a, an elective course in the counseling department um, mostly just out of pure curiosity and interest and she said you know what I think you got a little bit of a knack for this um, and you know I, I would challenge you to consider you know becoming a therapist and and I thought she was insane <laughs> <laughs> because at that time I was like grad school two kids under two. Oh and wow no way <laughs> like, okay you know and and so um but you know one thing led to another and my wife and I decided we decided to take the risk and, and and make the application and long story short I couldn't imagine doing anything different um you know and then got out into the field and, and found that I had a certain natural comfort or aptitude working with um, both youth, adults, families in really high risk populations with really co-occurring complexities in their life. And I didn't expect that. Uh, And yet was welcoming of being able to work with uh, folks who often, in my experience, a lot of other people who I was going to school with or were, were talking to were just like, oh, I don't like working with that population. Mm-hmm. That scares me or I don't feel like I can help them. Well, let's, first of all, that's, that's fascinating. Your background's fascinating. But let's, if we could put a little magnifying glass over what you said about having an affinity for people, kids and families who are in that position, high risk, talk more about that. What do you feel it is about you? And um, yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, some of it was almost stumbling into it by accident. I had a curiosity around, you know, how is it that 
connecting to people and how people connect to each other is really protective for them and really helps them stay in engaged in life in society in their families and in those circles and, and so some of my own you know research in grad school was starting to to focus around that and looking at relational connections and disconnections that helped people overcome feeling suicidal mm -hmm. and there was just again and again, both in the research and in my own research, things kept pointing back to life just seems more livable when there's meaningful, caring people that you're connected to as a part of that. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of these children, youth and adults that I started working with, they either felt like they were or actually were quite cut off from a lot of those resources. And so to have the honor of working with them, to journey alongside of them, um, to help them build a life worth living and make some of those connections uh, was something that it just felt like such an honor to me to be able to be a part of that. And, awesome. and I kept working there. That's awesome. So what are you, so you're, again, you're clinical director at this facility in Canada. Um, what do you do specifically there at the center? Okay. So in our center, we kind of have two branches. We have a, a general counseling um, and mental health center where we can work with children, youth, adults, families um, to help meet general goals, working with, you know, things like depression and anxiety, and probably a, a big part of where our work has expanded in these last uh, little while has been to open a branch for specifically around DBT and DBT treatment. We have lots of experience in the past working in public sector uh, for that and now to bring that to the general public and th through the private sector clinic where we're able to provide dbt treatment to um, children youth adults families uh, who are experiencing a lot of those co-occurring complexities and those big emotional fluctuations that are really getting in the way of helping them find their life worth living is this uh inpatient or outpatient or both we're outpatient uh, okay. in the community, and that's actually one of the great focuses of DBT as a treatment is we want to help people stay in their lives, in their communities, in their families, um, you know, even though a lot of the things they're struggling with might actually wind them up in hospital without, you know, the kind of work that we're able to do in the community. Right, right. So, um, so uh, you got me going here. So when someone, let's say a kid walks in to your treatment program walk us through what their treatment might look like mm. obviously it's gonna be different for different people blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know if we were to even just look kind of in broad strokes through a dbt lens um you know it, it starts like everything with that first phone call that first contact and and the therapy really does start then from that that first point of contact and that 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 first grasp that at forging a relationship to work together um, and then from there, an intake interview to really walk with a person through what is happening in your life, um, what problems are getting in the way, and, and how are we going to help you to find a life that's worth living for you? Because even though DBT works with a lot of life-threatening types of behaviors and conditions um, that people are experiencing, it, it's not a suicide prevention program. It's not just to stop doing these dangerous things. It's uh, if we can have a life with less suffering, more meaning, and a sense of worth to it, then those solutions will become less necessary. Um, and, you know, we can find a way through the despair and the suffering in a meaningful way. And so that starts looking like, you know, there's, there's really four big pieces that we offer folks. And these things all happen at the same time, individual structured therapy on a weekly basis skills training, usually in a group format for our, our youth, we do involve their caregivers in that as well. So they're all learning those same skills and strategies. We also offer coaching outside the therapy sessions, because one of the things we know is really hard is taking effective things that we're learning in therapy and actually using them out in our real life. Um, and then something that may be less often, less obvious rather to the client is that we as DBT therapists, we meet every week because working with really, you know, high risk populations is hard work and can be stressful. And so we help to take care of each other and help each other to improve in our work by meeting and supporting each other regularly as well. Uh, that sounds awesome. One of the, um, 
uh, facilities I used to work at when I was in California, uh, we were assessing and treating young kids who were showing early signs of psychosis. And a lot of our uh, treatment was family, mm -hmm. their family group therapy. Um, and it was, it was vital. So were you guys working with the family also? You bet. Yeah. yeah. And so parent, parent coaching and parent involvement in the skills training is a, is a key part of our adolescent DBT programs. Yeah. Let me ask you, PJ, when you first started doing this, I mean, you know, you, it sounded like you hit the ground running, but I, I kind of want to get an idea here of something, uh, how you approach this work when you first started out to where you are now, what was it like for you when you just started working with, with kids who were suicidal? Hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um, on one hand, I, I didn't find it as, as terrifying as some of my colleagues did. Um, I, I found just, you know, when you connect with, with a real person in a real way, um, you know, there, there's something about that human to human connection that, that was just normal, even in those really dangerous circumstances. Um, though at the same time, it can be really intimidating uh, working with um, families uh, where, uh, especially where youth is experiencing uh, a number of different stressors and, and, and a number of really high risk behaviors, and usually through no fault of their own, a, a lack of protection and support. Mm -hmm. So. I remember very particularly working with one young lady and, you know, several trips to hospital, several attempts on her own life, lots of non-suicidal self-injury, substance use, history and foster care, you name it, you, you paint the picture of the, one of the more horrific childhoods you could imagine, and it was probably a part of her history. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember sitting with her and it was a little bit um, daunting to think, you know, I'm the fourth therapist she's seen. And in her report, nothing has worked so far. And now here I am trying to say, now you got to do therapy again and try this all over again. And there was something in that moment that I don't know if it was a, a moment of, of, of wisdom or luck or both. Mm -hmm. When I just paused and said, you know, I, I I don't blame you for being skeptical about this whole thing working because it hasn't worked for you before. And I could imagine you're feeling entirely hopeless. And how is this going to be any different? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. And I said, you know what? We didn't get here overnight and we're not going to get out of here overnight, but are you willing to give it a try? And I can carry some hope for you until you're able to carry it for yourself again. Wow. PJ, you're doing it, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. And it was just like, that was a moment where she's like, you know what? I'll give this another session. That's amazing. And like, That's our foot in the door. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful, man. That's just like, you're just being real. You're not being a friggin' therapist. You're not being a counselor. You're just being a human being, like you're saying. And that's, that's, um, it's that's magic it seems so simple though right right yeah but, and yet but, we complicate it <laughs> and yet we complicate things this is, i had this uh, very similar experiences but that's that's so beautiful um what so was that earlier on for you or when was that, that in was your pretty early that was okay. like in my first I would say year or two as a therapist post grad school and, and having some experience working, you know, with this client population and in a few different settings, but at, at the same time, still really hadn't fully hit my stride. And, and I remember this, this client was particularly memorable for me because um, not only was it a lot of learning for me, but I, I really through my work with this particular young woman, um, noticed that something that I had a bit of a cognitive awareness of, but really hadn't encountered in clinical practice is how significantly trauma and trauma history overlaps with the clusters of symptoms that generally move people towards considering DBT as a possible treatment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there, like I said, an intellectual assent to this and the stats show us that there's a big overlap. Um, but I, I was in a position where I um, 
had a, an interesting experience in my early training where I had a wonderful supervisor, but uh, she also kind of almost scared me a little bit because, you know, she talked so passionately about her work and working in, in the trauma field and about how you needed special skills and training and competency. And I fully agreed with her, but I, I almost swung to the other side of the pendulum where I said, okay, I will recognize trauma. I will be trauma informed, but I'm not fully trauma trained. Therefore, I almost became something that we will recognize, but we will not talk about. And that almost actually, um, in fact, it did get in the way of me effectively helping this client. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, she had trauma in her history and we worked on, you know, her suicidality and her self-harm and her substance use and all these other things. And yet the suicidal thoughts still kept coming up and you know, and one day working with my team, um, you know, I was saying, you know, guys, I, I just don't get why, you know, we can't get past this strong, pervasive urge for suicide. She's got skills, she's got strategies, she's used so many of these things to effectively do so many meaningful things in her life. And yet, she hasn't quite found her life worth living yet. And one of my colleagues challenged me, they said, well, when she's thinking about dying, what is she not thinking about? And I paused and I said, well, I don't know. And they're like, just, just think about it. Think about what you know about this client and what is, because she's probably, this is probably serving a function for her. It's probably meeting a need for her. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, oh my gosh, she keeps talking about or mentioned early on in our work together that there were a few things that happened to her in her past that she just doesn't want to talk about. And I'm like, I bet you when she's thinking about dying, she's not thinking about those things. And, and my respect for her not wanting to talk about her trauma was actually getting in the way of helping her deal with the trauma. And that was a real wake up call for me that I need to get the skills and the training to incorporate trauma work into our work in DBT. Okay, say that again, your respect for her. You said your my respect for her not wanting to talk about her trauma was getting in the way of working through her trauma. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it was this, uh, you know, on the surface, you know, kind of, a, you know, hey, I want to work within my scope of practice. I'm not a trained trauma therapist, so I don't want to open up something that I can't, right. you know, actually help you process and work through. And I think that was, you know, there was, there was goodness in that. It's ethical right. practice. And at the same time, um, you know, I wasn't actually able to help this client, you know, with this particular problem. And that was getting in the way. Right. Right. Uh, of her actually getting to the goal that she wanted in treatment. And that was, you know, finding a place where she didn't uh, want to have these, these urges towards suicide happening all the time, weekly, mm -hmm. daily in her life. Mm -hmm. So that for me, that was a big wake up call is, you know, we, it's not good enough to just help people with skills and strategies in, in order to, to help with all of these things that are going on in their life. If they've experienced trauma, I've also got to get the skills and the training to be able to incorporate these two things together mm -hmm. because these things go so hand in hand for so many people. Mm -hmm. Getting back to, um, you know, that, that amazing moment you were sharing with that, that woman and um it was just so beautiful. You were talking about I, what we, I forget what you specifically you shared, but it was just such a, you were relating to her on a, just in such an, in a human way. You know, when I said it seems so easy, you know, what do you feel it takes for a therapist or counselor or whomever to be in the moment like that, to be willing to do that, to be able to do that? Because it seems to me, that it's very easy to, you know, go into a session thinking about page 22 of some great book you're reading that you want to have a great technique that you want to implement. But this other part, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on this, PJ? You know, it wasn't easy to arrive at, at that willingness to have an appropriate amount of, of vulnerability and transparency in therapy. Um, in fact, I, I had one clinical supervisor who helped me work through this and, and, and she said, you know, 
you, you're you're working really hard to have you know the the skills and the strategies and the techniques she's like but are you just being real and trusting your gut mm. and i was like no that's terrifying <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what if i'm wrong <laughs> right and she's just like that's that's your growth curve she's like that's what you need to do you need to start pushing yourself into that place and trust that you're reading those nonverbal things and you're processing that information and that's giving you important information that you need to trust in order to just be a real human mm -hmm. in the room with the other person and less consumed about doing the right thing or using the right technique right, right. Um, <laughs> that took a lot of practice and supervision and I yeah, I was on my own part being willing to fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 the fear maybe behind that. I I was so consumed with with that early on for me, you know, I felt like I needed to have the right answer. And uh, if I didn't have the right answer, I needed to get the right answer. Um, and it was getting in the way of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. As clinical director, how do you model that for the people who are working with you i think um one of the ways that we we do that so we we as a team of therapists like i was mentioning part of our model is to to meet as a team weekly and in that moment in those times when we're together you know we don't bring title into the room uh, I'm not the clinical director. My partner isn't the director of training. You aren't just an associate. We're equals. Um, and we're here to, and, and all of the clients that we work with are our clients. Um, not, not your client, not my client, our client. And so part of that is just being real and honest. I'm just as likely to bring up and model bringing up what am I struggling with? What am I failing at? How am I getting stuck? Um, and, and with all of the people that I work with, regardless of whether they're someone who just came out of grad school and joined us a week ago, or whether it's somebody who's, you know, my senior in experience, we, we, we're all in this together, we're all equal. And to uh, be able to just be honest about that, and we're all helping each other get better. And we've all got some, some wisdom to contribute here. Uh, and I want to hear that. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing in terms of uh how this pandemic is impacting the people you're seeing? It is certainly having an enormous impact. Um, on one hand, we're seeing, you know, on a clinical level, we're seeing, you know, increased incidences of anxiety, depression, you know, high-risk behaviors like self-harm and suicidality. But I think even on a practical level, when clients are coming in the door, um, they're fatigued, they're tired. Um, and, and they've often been, cut off for a number of complicated reasons from the few things that they did find life-giving. Um, being able to visit family, being able to do the sorts of activities that are rejuvenating and, and forms of self-care for themselves. And so I think navigating the pandemic has, um, for a lot of our clientele, has, has made it uh, challenging to, to kind of keep up the stamina of doing the, the skillful things they need to do to keep themselves in a good place. And they're coming off through, often through the door exhausted. Mm -hmm. And it's going, you know, like, I don't know, I'm doing all the right things and I'm feeling worse and I can't do the things that I used to do. It's starting to feel a bit hopeless. And so being able to, to then, you know, let's say, hey, I, I'm with you. This, these are tough times, and and you know, and we're we're in it together. Right, right. Um, are are clients coming to you, folks, once a week? Or how many, how Typically, many yeah. Okay. So folks who are engaging in in um, the comprehensive DBT program are, are usually coming in once a week with us. And uh, you know, in our general clinic side, we have other clients that you know with other concerns who are coming in less frequently or at different intervals. But you know, folks in our DBT treatment side are are coming through weekly for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's um, bef before we kind of wind down, or as we wind down here, I want to have you share an early clinical error hmm. what you learned from it yeah um i think um probably the uh the biggest error that uh that i can remember making um was <laughs> with uh one young man that i was working with and um he came in and 
I was so concerned with building, you know, rapport and having a clinical alliance and, and not offending him so that he'll stay in treatment. Uh, and, and yes, so he'll stay in treatment, but also, you know, that, that little nagging part of what some of us experience of like, you know, well, I don't want my client to hate me either, you know, and you know, and he came in and he started telling me about his week and, and he started telling me about how horrible he was feeling. And, and I, I remember, you know, even seeing some, you know, he was tracking some of his, you know, things that he was paying attention to, like his taking of medication or his urges for self-harm. He was tracking those things on a little card and he brought that in and showed me and I saw a few blanks on the card, which was very unusual for him. He was a very conscientious man. And, and, I, and I looked at his card and I saw how down he was feeling. And, and what I did is I, I followed my urge to want to comfort him. And so, so, well, how are you going? How are you feeling now? And okay, we, we, can, we can get through this. And I was very encouraging and warm with him. And what I didn't do was ask him about, you know, some of the more difficult things. And I didn't look at those blanks on that card where he was tracking things. And, and some of the things that were blank were around his taking of medication that he was prescribed and around his whether or not he acted on some of his urges for self-harm. And, you know, and that was a mistake because I didn't ask him. Um, and he was in a place where uh, I found out after the fact that he was hoarding up his medication. Mm. He was feeling really desperate. And uh, two days after we met, uh, he ended up in hospital with an overdose. Mm. And um, that was a, a terrifying moment for me. I, I failed as a therapist. I didn't, I didn't do due diligence in, in, in looking at um, those things and asking those questions. I was so concerned with comforting that I, I missed um, the, this, this red flag of risk. You didn't that, ask about those things because you didn't want to, what, open up a, some Pandora's box or... Yeah, yeah, I was just like, you know, he's already had such a bad week, you know, maybe he didn't, right. maybe he didn't fill those things in for a reason. So why mm -hmm. would I want to add to that? Right. Why would I want to stress him out in his therapy session? Were the, mm -hmm. the thoughts that I was having at the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and from that mistake, I was just like, you know what, you know, sometimes the most caring thing I can do for a client is, is to ask those tough questions in, in, in DBT terms. We talk, we talk about that as, you know, going where angels fear to tread, you know, and that's, that's the ground that, that I need to walk with my clients. And that's, you know, that mistake, you know, thank, thank goodness he, uh, he made a full recovery and returned to therapy. And I, and not only did I never make that mistake again with him, but, but again, uh, with other clients, um, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes it takes taking that, taking that risk and, and going to those scary places in order to meet the client just where they're at in that moment. Yeah, yeah. man, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Um, all right, PJ, as we close down here, how about a go-to book recommendation, whether trauma-related or not, or DBT-related or not? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, if you want a, a great read in the DBT world, even if you don't like if you don't start by reading, you know, the clinical textbooks and whatnot, but, uh, but Marshall Linehan um, put out a memoir uh, earlier this year, Building a Life Worth Living, and uh, it's a great read uh, and really lets you in to her own experience and the developing of the treatment and, and her own lived experience. And uh, I was both, you know, touched, moved and motivated in reading it. And I, I highly recommend it. Um, and, you know, and when it comes into the, the treatment world uh, of, you know, how do we incorporate trauma into our work in therapy and into DBT and whatnot, um, you know, even though it's not a, a, a book yet, but Melanie Harnett has, has published some wonderful um, studies in the DBT world about how to integrate uh, PTSD treatment into DBT and, and some of our own work. We haven't published anything yet, but we're in progress is how to incorporate other forms of trauma therapy into working with the population who we're doing DBT treatment with. And so highly recommend anything you can get your hands on in those areas. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I'll have those linked up at the show notes page here at the trauma therapist podcast.com. PJ, man. Awesome meeting you and awesome having you on here. And I really just appreciate your, your openness and, um, uh, your humanness. I love it. I love it. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks so much. It's been an honor being here. All right, man. We'll be in touch. Take care. Take care.